Today's scripture reading is from Luke 7, 36 to 50. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. We also want to welcome people who are tuning in from home. Uh, we recognize that with COVID cases going up, we want to be more careful. And so, um, yeah, we just want to welcome you as well. Um, we're picking up, we're continuing our sermon series to the book of Luke. And today we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And if you were here for service, you'll recall um, that Pastor Rowe preached on the same text that we'll be looking at today, but he focused primarily on the context, the setting of this story. And if you remember from last week's sermon, you'll know that there's a guy named Simon who was a Pharisee, and he invited Jesus over to his house for a meal. And the customary back then, the custom was that it was an open invitation for anyone to come in and listen in and conversation between Jesus and Simon. Now, as the story goes, there's a woman. We don't know who she is. We're not given a name. But all we're told is that she is a, a woman of the city and that she is a sinner. And we're told that this woman comes and she crashes the party by doing something that is socially unacceptable at that time. Now, Simon in his heart is upset. And he's judging the woman and Jesus for not stopping the woman. And in his heart, he says, if this man, talking about Jesus, knew what sort of person is touching him, a sinner, right, then he would not allow her to do that. And this is what he's thinking in his heart. And that's where we're going to pick up today's sermon. We're going to be focusing on the parable that Jesus shares as he responds to this attitude that Simon has. And to help guide our time together, these are the three points that we'll be looking at. We're going to be looking at the lesson of the parable. Number two, we're going to be looking at the perspective from which the parable is told. And last but not least, we're going to be looking at Simon's biggest problem. Okay, Simon's biggest problems. So let's look at the first one, the lesson of the parable. Starting in verse 41, this is what it says. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And just so we understand the context of this, one denarii equaled about one day's wage of work. Okay? So one denarii is whatever, let's say it's $100 in our time for one day's work, then this particular individual, one person owed 500 days worth of work, while the other owed 50. Verse 42, it says, when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. And then Jesus asks this question. He says, now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. Now this might be stating the obvious, and we can all conclude, come to this conclusion just by reading this parable, but the lesson Jesus is trying to teach is this. 
The more you have been forgiven, the more you will love. It's a simple concept and we all get it, right? Think about it. If you owed someone $10 and that person said, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. I got you. You'd be like, really? Thanks, man. I appreciate that. And you, you'd be thankful, but, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Now, what if you owed someone $100 and that person's like, no, I got you. You'd be like, wow, that's really generous. Thank you, right? What if you owe that person $1,000? Then that will make you pause for a moment and say, really? That's a lot of money. You sure about this? What if you owed $100,000 and you now had debt collectors coming after you and you were in a desperate situation you couldn't pay this off? And then someone comes along and pays off your debt in full. You see, in that moment, it wouldn't just be a, hey, thanks, man, I appreciate it. It would be a thank you. You've saved my life. You have no idea how big this is for me. You see, there's a direct correlation between forgiveness and love. The amount of debt that is forgiven directly is connected to the intensity of love and gratitude that you show to that individual. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across. The one who has been forgiven much loves much. But on the flip side, the one who has been forgiven little loves little. Now, even though this may seem obvious to us, we often forget this very source of our love for God, right? I remember in my early years of Christianity, or in, in, of being a Christian, I tried so hard to love God and to keep that love going. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I used to try so hard to love God, and anytime I felt like I wasn't loving God the way I used to, then I would do all these things, right? And if anyone asked me, how do I love God more, then I would give them a list of things to do. Go to church. Are you praying? Are you reading the Bible? You should listen to more sermons. You should listen to more Christian songs. You should go to retreats, right? We have a list of things that we tell people to do. But the parable seems very clear in how we love God. He says the love that we have for God is only but just the response to what God has done for us. It's not what we can do for God, but rather it's recognizing what God has done for us. That's where our love for God comes from, not in what we do, but in what God has done. And you see, this is radically different from how every other religion works in this world. You see, if you were to ask Simon this question, how do you love God? He will give you a list of things to do and to not do. But if you were to ask Jesus, how do you love God more? He will say, look at what God has done for you. The one who has been forgiven much loves much as a response. And this is an incredibly important concept and a foundation to our Christian faith that we need to hold. Now, this leads to my next point, which is the perspective from which this parable is told. In this parable that we just read, you have two debtors. One owes a lot of money, and the other much less. Now, it's clear who these two debtors are supposed to represent. You see, the one who owed 500 denarii represents the woman that is crashing this party, while the other person, the one who only owns 50 denarii, represents Simon, right? And you know, I'll be honest with you. Growing up, I used to really wrestle with this text. It confused me. Think about this, okay? It seems as though this parable and this story is saying that Simon is a lesser sinner, Okay? He's only been forgiven of little because he's only sinned little. And that's why he has little love, right? But isn't that the goal of Christianity? Isn't that the goal of all of us to try to sin less and less in our lives? So how is Simon at fault for this? He's doing what we're all trying to do, which is sin less. But he's at fault because we're told that because he has been forgiven little, therefore he loves little. So then the question is, are you supposed to sin more so that you could be forgiven more and then you can love God more, right? Is Jesus in this parable affirming that Simon is indeed a holier person than the woman, that his sins are much less than the woman? The answer is no, of course not. You see, what Jesus is doing here, because he's addressing Simon, right, 
Jesus is masterfully telling this parable from the perspective of Simon himself. He's entering into Simon's world. You see, in Simon's world, he has categories of big sins and little sins. In his mind, yes, he is a sinner just like everyone else, but his sins are small and excusable. He is a small sinner. On the other hand, someone like this woman is, falls in the category of big, a, a big sinner. She commits these big sins that deserve great punishment from God. This is how Simon thinks. This is how he perceives himself and all those around him. And so Jesus is using that mindset to try to teach Simon a lesson. But there's something that we have to understand about this, okay? The way Simon thinks is actually the way we all think. It's the way this world works. Every single person, religious or not, has a category of big and small offenses, right? Things that are considered really bad and things that are considered not so bad, right? And if we're really honest with ourselves, most of us, if not all of us, think that we only commit the small sins in our lives. We say things like, you know what, I'm not perfect, I recognize that, but I'm a relatively good person, right? Yeah, I make mistakes here and there, but at least I'm not like those people doing those sins. Yeah, I had a lapse of judgment here, but that's not who I am, right? And that's the thing with the human heart, is we have a way of justifying our sins and making them look smaller than they really are and giving ourselves a whole lot of grace while at the same time magnifying the sins of other people. We minimize our sins while at the same time demonizing the sins of others. And the problem with this mindset, the problem with this worldview in which we create big sins and small sins, we say we only commit small sins, and here are people who create big sins, is that it breeds a heart, an attitude of self-righteousness a spiritual arrogance, a critical and judgmental spirit towards everyone else, all the while being blinded to our own sinful self. This was Simon's problem. This is what he had. He was so convinced that his sins were small and few that he was blinded to the fact that he was a great sinner desperately in need of forgiveness. In his world, he only owed 50 denarii to God, while everyone owes 500, 5,000, 5 million denarii. You see, Simon is like the cancer patient that doesn't know he has cancer, right? He can't see it. And this is what's amazing about this parable that Jesus tells. You see, Jesus tells the parable from the perspective of Simon, one in which he is supposed to be the hero, and yet he's able to masterfully show just how sinful Simon is. You can tell Simon's starting to get it when Jesus asked the question, which of them, right? He says, oh yeah, you're really the one with the lesser sinner? Let's imagine that there's two, there are two people, one who owe little sin, one who owe a lot of sin. They're both forgiven. Which of the two will love when the debt collector cancels both debt? Simon begrudgingly right? Says, I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. He's beginning to see that even in his world where he's the hero, he's now become, he sees what flaws he has. You see, this was an obvious question, and yet Simon had a hard time giving a straight answer. Jesus, through this parable, is working in Simon's heart and exposing him for what he really is a great sinner, but also a sinner who was blind. He may look clean on the outside. He may look righteous on the outside. But God is, Jesus is beginning to show Simon for what he really is on the inside. And this leads to my final point, Simon's biggest problem. If you look starting in verse 44, this is what it says. Then Jesus, then turning toward the woman, Jesus said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and yet you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with tears, with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, 
but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. And then he ends by saying, but he who was forgiven little loves little. You see, what Jesus is doing here is he's showing the stark contrast between Simon and the woman. And in this contrast, what Jesus is highlighting is the display of incredibly extravagant love by this woman. And in contrast to that, the cold, distant heart of Simon himself. You see, Simon's biggest problem is that he lacks love. And you know, for a lot of us, lacking love falls in the category of small sin, right? It's not that big of a deal to us. But we're going to see why this is a big deal. The whole issue with Simon that Jesus is trying to get across is that he lacks love, and that's what he's addressing here. The reason why Simon lacks love is because his righteousness comes from his own effort. He himself is the author of his, of his own faith. He himself is the author of his own righteousness. And so he's putting in a lot of effort in being a good, moral person. He may very well be an upstanding citizen, right? The sort of person you'd want coming to your church. He does everything right. His moral compass is always straight. He doesn't make any mistakes. He always abides by the rules, right? But the irony of this and the irony and something that God sees is that in his pursuit of holiness, in his pursuit and his effort of being righteous, he's failing to do the most important thing. You see, any Pharisee at that time would have known that the greatest commandment is to love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, this, lo- this commandment, to love God and to love your neighbor, is the greatest commandment, and this commandment is the commandment upon which every other commandment in the Bible hinges upon. You can't obey God, you can't love God without loving your neighbors. You can't You can't obey any of the other commandments without obeying the greatest commandment. And yet what we see is that he is utterly failing in this area. You see, Simon had no love for Jesus. He has no love for God. The reason why he lives his righteous life is because of his love for himself. He doesn't need God to help him. He's got it on his own. And also because of that, he despises a lot of his neighbors. He judges and he looks down on those around him. Why? Because remember the lesson of the parable. There's a direct connection between forgiveness and love. And Simon doesn't think he needs a lot of forgiveness because he doesn't consider himself a sinner. And as a result, he lacks the most important thing for a Christian, which is love. So the question that I have is, who is the worst sinner? Who's worse between the woman and Simon? I would argue that by the end of this story, Simon is the worst sinner. By the end of the story, the woman is forgiven, but Simon is not. By the end of the story, the woman has drawn closer to Jesus, where Simon has hardened his heart against them. By the end of this story, Story, we see that Simon has kept the greatest commandment, while, or the woman has kept the greatest commandment, while Simon refuses to do so. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus says this Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, by the end of this story, one person is saved, while the other remains lost. Now, what does this mean for us, right? Last week, Pastor Rowe ended his message with a final application, which was this. Don't be like Simon. But you know, the funny thing is we all listen to Simon. We all play Simon Says really well, right? The truth is we all have a temptation to be just like Simon, And I would argue that for Christians, this temptation is even bigger. You see, for many of us, I would imagine, there is a moment in our lives, for many of us in this room, there is a moment in our lives when we were the woman 
in this story. There was a moment in our lives when we were the woman and we recognized just how great of a sinner we were and we were desperately in need of forgiveness, right? Maybe this was in youth group for you or in college or maybe it was a recent event that happened. But in that moment, you heard the gospel and you were floored by the good news. You said, how can my God, my king, die for me? All my sins are forgiven, really? And so God's grace is so amazing. His love is so precious. And because all of our sins up to that point had been forgiven, right, then we began to respond naturally in love. We go to church. We sing on Sundays. We, we serve in different ministries. We go on mission trips. We do all these things as a result of God's love for us. Not only that, but we begin to walk away from the former things of life, right? We don't do the bad sins that we used to before. We stop doing drugs. We stop cheating. We stop lying. We stop stealing. We stop doing all these big things in our, in, in, that we used to do that we've been forgiven of, right? Yes, there are times when we still struggle with the small sins and sins that other people can't see, but I, I, we stop doing all the big sins. But here's the thing. Over time, we start to notice that our love for God starts to dwindle. We become more jaded more apathetic. We simply go through the motion of Christianity. We don't feel that love anymore. We come to service, but only because that's our Christian responsibility. We give offering because we're supposed to. And over time, we begin to find other loves in this world to push out, to crowd out our love for God. What happens? Well, go back to the equation, the formula Jesus gave in the parable. Forgiveness equals love. The greater the forgiveness of your sins, the greater the love you have for God. See, if this is true for you, if you are in a place where your love has grown so cold and it's almost non-existent, perhaps the reality is that you've lost sight of God's grace you've stopped receiving God's forgiveness of your sins. You see, in our minds, we were these great sinners back in those days, right? And the great forgiveness we experienced was back during conversion, maybe in college, maybe in youth group. But as the months and years went by, the only great forgiveness we ever experienced was a thing of the past. And that becomes more and more distant, and it becomes smaller and smaller in appearance. You see, we were saved by grace, but now we maintain our salvation through our own works. And so somehow we went from being the woman in the story to now being the Simon of the story. Our love grows cold towards God, and it is also, and at the same time, we begin to grow harsher, more critical towards other people. We show less grace. Rather than welcoming sinners, sinners in big categories sin with open arms, we shun them. We say, you don't belong here. We don't want you in our midst, right? This is what Simon was doing, and this is the temptation that we all have. You know, and as I was preparing for this message, I had to really wrestle in my own heart. You know, if I were to be honest with you, I think in the last two years, I've grown colder in my love towards God and towards others than ever before. You know, just the other day, and I know this is really silly, but just the other day, some random stranger said in passing, thanks, buddy, and that really irked me. I, I felt so dismissed by someone calling me a buddy, right? And I, I couldn't get it out of my mind, and so I, I told my I told my my brother or my band of brothers about it. I, I was like, "Hey, what do you guys think about this? Does this ever bother you?" And I was wrestling through it, but I realized that nowadays I get much more quickly irritated. Right? I get offended with things that are so minuscule, and my anger sometimes are, are out of blown out of proportion. They shouldn't. I shouldn't be this upset over something this small. And yet I've noticed that my heart has become colder towards towards other people. As I was preparing for this message, I realized that I was failing to live up the greatest commandment too. When I stand before God, God is not going to see how good my church attendance was or how faithful my tithe giving was. 
what he's going to ask is, did you love well? Did you keep the greatest commandment to love God and to love your neighbors? Love is what matters at the end of the day. And yet, as I live this Christian life, I find that the tendency to be like Simon grows naturally in my own heart. I begin to have categories of big and small sin, and I place people in these different categories. In Revelation chapter 2, 2 to 4, this is what it says. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not found them to be false, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up my namesake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Have you abandoned your first love? How do we love God? How do we go back to the love we first had? Forgiveness equals love. And the only way we can recognize that we're being forgiven today is to realize what sinner we are now. You may not have the sins of the woman. You may not have these external sins in your life now, but you may very well have the sins of Simon. And I would argue that the sins of Simon are much worse. They're not visible, right? And yet they're far more deadly. So what do we do? How do we respond to this? How do we return back to this first love? The answer is very simple. It's time to do an inventory check. It's to have a reality check. To stop telling ourselves that our sins are small, that we are relatively good people. But to stand before holy God and see how much we fall short. In the same way that we go to the doctor's office to do our health checkup, we go to God and we ask him to reveal the sins in our hearts because we are terrible judges of our own sins. Our sins, as I said before, will look different from the sins of the past, but they're still sins nonetheless. You may not have the sins of the woman, but you have the sins of Simon. And the greater danger with having the sin of Simon is that you don't think you need forgiveness. You don't draw near to God. The sins of pride, arrogance, hatred, self-righteousness, judgmentalism, indifference, impatience, inability, or the refusal to love. You see, the gospel is not something we experience just once in our lifetime and then move on. But the gospel is something we live or experience and that we need to experience the renewal of every single moment of our lives. When was the last time you had a gospel renewal in your life? When you were floored for the forgiveness of your Simon sins. To know that God forgave you not just for the sins of the past, but even your sins right now, which may be much more heinous to God than what you think it is. It's time we do an update. As we get older, the reality is that our sins will grow more. We will realize what great sinner we are. Whatever sins we, whatever image we had of how great our sins were back 15, 20, 30 years ago pales in comparison to who you and I are today. The older you get, the more we realize just how wicked and sinful we are in our hearts. And the only way we can remain humble and compassionate towards others is if we are being forgiven, if we're receiving that same forgiveness from God today as yesterday. Now I want to end with this. In today's parable, we've looked at the two individuals, right? The two debtors. But if you go back and look at the parable, there's actually a third person, the money lender. In this story, we're told that the money lender forgave the debt of the two debtors, right? One who owed 50, the other who owed 500. But here's the thing. The only way that the money lender can say, hey, don't worry about your debt, is if he himself 
pays the price, if he himself absorbs the cost of that debt. The only way that the money lender could say, hey, I got you, your, your debts are forgiven, is if he himself pays for that. Now we know that Simon is the 50 denarii individual, the woman is the 500 denarii individual. So who is the money lender? At the end of today's passage in verse 48, Jesus turns to the woman and he says, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Jesus forgave the sins of this woman. Jesus is the money lender. So then the question we have to ask is what does repayment of sin look like? How can Jesus pay off the sin debt of this woman. In Romans 6, 23, we're told that the wages of sin is death. The price of sin is death. A holy God must punish all evil doings here on earth. If he doesn't, if he lets things slide by, then he becomes an unjust, an unjust God. And so how did Jesus absorb the debt of you and I, the debt of this woman? You know, what's really interesting is that in this story, the issue is that the woman came and touched Jesus. You see, if this woman had come and she listened on the sideline with everyone else as Jesus and Simon were having their meal discussion, then everything would have been okay. Yeah, Simon may have been uncomfortable with her being in their presence, but he wouldn't have that big of an issue, right? But you know what the issue is? The issue is that this woman who was considered unclean touched Jesus. That's what was bothering him. You see, he said, if this Jesus, who, if he's a prophet, if he really knew what sort of person this was, who was touching him, a sinner, right? That's the issue. Why is that an issue? Because back in those days, for the Jewish individuals, they believed that if an unclean person touched another person, then that person became unclean as well. Simon would never let this woman touch him because this woman was unclean, and therefore he would be unclean. Right? And yet, this woman, who was not supposed to touch anyone, comes and touches Jesus, kisses his feet. And the question is, why did Jesus let this woman touch him? Why did Jesus become ceremonially unclean by this woman touching him? It was to show a greater truth of what Jesus came to do. It was to show that Jesus, the perfectly clean, became unclean so that the unclean can be made clean. Did you get that? The clean became unclean, so the unclean can be made clean. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For our sake he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, Jesus absorbed all of our sins. He paid the debt, the punishment of all of our sins. So that what you and I are left with is forgiveness, is holiness, it's righteousness. We will never be truly righteous before God by our own efforts. It's only by the, by the righteousness that Christ purchased that we are able to stand before God and say, I am sinless. I can stand before a holy God. And you know what's amazing about this story is that for the woman... There's a sense of finality, right? Your sins are forgiven. But there isn't the same level of finality for Simon. Jesus doesn't condemn him for the rest of eternity. It's open-ended as if Simon has an option to respond to this teaching of Jesus. You know, one of the biggest criticisms that Pharisee, the Pharisees gave to Jesus was that he dined with sinners like the tax collectors. Well, guess what? Jesus also dined with sinners like the Pharisees. Jesus was reaching both the women and the Pharisees of his time. And the question for us, for many of us who have experienced God's grace from the women's perspective, the women of the city, but now sit in the Pharisaic perspective, have you received forgiveness of your self-righteous attitude? 
of your lack of love for God and love for those around you. We can't fabricate love for God. We can't force it in our hearts. It's a natural response to what God has done for us. And that's why we go to the Lord's Supper every single week, right? When Jesus, when Simon invited Jesus into his table, he excluded people. He said, you're not welcomed here. He had different categories. He said, only those who deserve, only those who are righteous, who have little sins, are allowed to enter into my house, not the women of the city, right? But Jesus opens his table to all of us, to great and small sinners, to sinners who have visible sins and those who have invisible sins, to both the Pharisees and to the women. And so if you guys can take out your communion cups. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body that is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood that was shed for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. I don't know where you sin or where you, where you stand before God in the spectrum of the woman to the Pharisee. But here's what I know. We're all sinners in this very moment in need of God's grace. And we need to experience God's great forgiveness in every season of our lives. And so before we take this meal, can we take a moment and repent of whatever sin the Lord may have you repent of, whatever sin may be tugging in your heart. And if you can't think of anything, if you say, man, I have no sins, that's what you need to repent of. And ask God to reveal your sin the way he sees it the sins that are invisible to our eyes, but that are ever so present before God, the very reason for why Jesus died on the cross. So let's take a moment now, coming before the Lord, confessing our sins, and we'll take the Lord's help together. Let's pray. God, we come before you. And first and foremost, we thank you that you are a God who forgives us today. You're not a God who simply gave us forgiveness in the past or just a few times, but your forgiveness is ongoing throughout our lives. And as we've seen in today's text, we so desperately need your forgiveness every moment of our lives. And so we confess our sins before you. And we ask that you would forgive us for even these sins, even the sins of self-righteousness, sins of annoyance, hatred, sin of not loving you or those around us. And I pray that as we experience your forgiveness today, that from there, our love for you and those around us will begin to grow and that we will begin to live a life of love as you have first loved us. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.